Right, so this will be our last lecture for the class, and we'll be going over uh, bioinformatics and uh, protein sequence analysis. So what's left for the class is to analyze our DNA sequences of our uh, mutant PCR, and we'll be going over this later, but I'll be talking to you guys about how to use Finch TV. Um, we'll be doing blast analysis of our uh, gene product, uh, or the, the protein sequence of it, and uh, I'll actually go over a little bit of this uh, at the end of this uh, PowerPoint. And then we'll be looking for uh, non-Drosophila melanogaster homologs. Uh, and in fact, for my students specifically, I want you guys to look for human homologs. And if you can't, uh, we can go over looking at other uh, organisms. And then finally, we'll be uh, using FlyBase and NCBA, NCBA BLAST to conduct our uh, DNA BLASTs. So the first thing we're going to talk, be talking about are the homologs, orthologs, and paralogs. Um, so this is pretty important, uh, so make sure you guys know this. But uh, so homology uh, is in general just two sequences with similarities. So homologs are genes related to a second gene by, a descendant, uh, by a descent from a common and ancestral DNA sequence. Um, and orthologs are genes in different species that are evolved from a common ancestral gene. Um, paralogs, on the other hand, are genes related by duplication within a genome. Now this is you know, a bunch of words and it's pretty confusing. But this figure uh, pretty much tells it all. Uh, so homologs, as you can tell, is this like umbrella term that covers orthologs and paralogs. So as long as the the genes are similar uh, in sequence, they're considered homologs. Now orthologs are um, the same gene within different organisms. So here we're looking at on the left side, you can see um, alpha globin and uh, alpha globin of a frog, alpha globin of a chick, and alpha globin of a mouse are considered orthologs, whereas a mouse alpha globin and a mouse beta globin are paralogs. So alpha globin and beta globin are actually gene, uh, gene duplications of each other. So I forgot which one's uh, a duplication of the other, but pretty much these two are duplicated genes with different functions uh, inside of the organism. So here uh, we have a question, Drosophila melanogaster has homologs of the following mammalian proteins or peptides except for um, and then A, the heat shock protein 70 chaperone, uh, B, myosin, C, the P53 uh, tumor suppressor, and D, beta globin, uh, and E, insulin. And the answer to this is beta globin. And the reason for this is because beta globin um, is generally uh, used uh, for carrying oxygen. But, uh, but because Drosophila melanogaster don't have blood, uh, they don't have, you know, RBCs, and therefore they don't have beta globin. Um, and uh, here is the human beta globin amino acid sequence, and you guys can do the blast for this later. Um, um, and then when you do the blast, you can tell that uh, beta globin does not, indeed does not have a, a homolog in Drosophila melanogaster. Um, on the other hand, this is the human enolase amino acid sequence. Uh, and if you do a blast on this, you'll actually see a, um, let's see, yeah, right here. So. If you do a blast on human enolase, you'll see that there is indeed a uh, homolog in uh, Drosophila. And the reason for this is because enolase is, a, is part of the glycolysis pathway, and therefore, because you know, both humans and flies need to uh, conduct glycolysis, uh, we both have homologs of this enolase gene. Um, here is a, so you guys seen this from Micah's lecture from last week, but it's a, uh, it's pretty much showing amino acids uh, that are similar on a, on a like a figure. Um, so like the ones here are like small uh, amino acids. Here are the ones that are hydrophobic. Um, and then here are the ones that are polar. And these are kind of like the big groups. And then there's like smaller uh, groups within that. And then just the main point, like takeaway of this figure is when you're conducting a protein blast, it's a lot more complicated than a um, DNA blast. So things to take note of when doing a protein blast is like the algorithm actually, uh, I guess, accounts for similarities in proteins. Uh, so it's not just black or white where it's, it's the same or not the same, but if it's similar, it also gets a score for that uh, when you do the protein blast. So um, this is arbitrary cutoffs, but uh, this is what kind of what we'll be using for uh, doing our blasts. So 
Again, these are suggested blast cutoffs for uh, determining homology. So for when you're doing nucleotide blasts, what we generally go with is an E-value cutoff of 10 to the negative 6 or less um, in an identity of 70% or more. Whereas when we're doing protein-based uh, searches or protein blasts, we look for an E-value of 10 to the negative 3 or less and then an identity of 25% or more. Things to keep in mind, uh, for E-values, the lower the better. It's kind of like a P-value. So the lower, the more confident we are of the uh, blast. And again, the identity is just how uh, similar your protein is uh, to the protein that you're blasting against. All right, so the next thing we'll talk about are uh, protein motifs and domains. So motif is a short conserved region of a protein and it's typically 10 to 20 continuous amino acids uh, long, whereas a domain is a region of a protein that can adopt like a 3D structure. And generally this 3D structure has like a function in these proteins. And the first example we'll look at is a protein motif. Uh, so protein motifs can be represented as a consensus or a profile. Um, and the example here is an outer membrane lipoprotein from bacteria. And if you look at the right side of it, you can see uh, in red the motif that is a consensus. Whereas protein domains uh, can be considered like the building blocks of proteins. And um, if you look at the, the image at the bottom, this is the human proteasome protein structure. And, and highlighted are different domains of this uh, proteasome or protein. Another example we have is a DNA binding domain, uh, the zinc finger. So this zinc finger domain is actually used for uh, binding onto DNA and holding it apart. Uh, and as you can see here, you can see the consensus in uh, gr yellow and green and blue of the uh, amino acids that play a role in actually holding the DNA. Um, when it comes to protein domains, they can extend for the length of a protein, uh, as you can see in the blue on the top. They can occupy certain subsets of the protein sequence, so they can be at the beginning or maybe the end. And these uh, protein domains can also occur more than one time. So as you can see in the example in the bottom, you have a protein domain that is actually uh, appearing multiple times. Um, Here's another example. Uh, here are just multiple proteins with this MBD domain. Um, and as you can tell, this MBD domain can really be anywhere in really different uh, proteins. All right, so the next topic that we'll cover are uh, mutations. And mutations, as we all know, are changes in the genetic material of a, for example, a cell or a virus. Um, and point mutations, specifically, are chemical changes in just one base pair of a gene. And, um, and even a s change in a, in a single base pair can cause the uh, production of an abnormal protein. And the example here is in hemoglobin, where even a single nucleotide can change, for example, your glutamic acid in normal hemoglobin into a valine, which causes the sickle cell phenotype. Point mutations uh, can be divided into two general categories, a base pair substitution or uh, base pair indels, or insertions, or deletions. And these can be silent, disabling, or lethal. So this slide is pretty important, so make sure you guys know this. But uh, for point mutations, you can have transversions, which is where you have a purine uh, for pyrimidine, or a pyrimidine for a purine uh, change, whereas a transition uh, is where you have a purine for a purine, or a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine. And uh, to make sense of all that, you have a figure here, which, uh, which shows you uh, the transitions, which is where you have, again, a purine for a purine, um, here to here, or, or transversions, which is where you have a purine changed into a pyrimidine. Um, so this figure uh, pretty much explains the last slide. Um, here is an example of a silent mutation. So. What a silent mutation shows is that well, even though you have a mutation, you do not have any changes in your uh, amino acids. So here is the wild type, and here is your mutant. And even after this uh, A instead of a G uh, change, your amino acid sequence is still the same. So that's a silent mutation. Uh, your missense mutations are mutations that cause a change in, in a single amino acid. So here uh, you can see the missense mutation is uh, here to here, uh, glycine to a serine. A nonsense mutation is uh, is what we call like a premature stop. So here you 
this amino acid uh, sequence is changed to a, a stop right after the methionine, after the mutation. So that's a nonsense mutation. Um, generally, the more deleterious mutations are the ones that are frame shift or like insertions or deletions. So here you have an insertion, an extra A, and because of this insertion, you have a premature stop. Um, so as long as you have an insertion or a deletion of something not a multiple of three uh, nucleotides, you generally will get a frame shift. Um, and the other example that we have is a... Uh, so this is a frame shift where you have a deletion, and in this case, you have an ex extensive missense. So just by deleting an A, everything after, or yeah, just by deleting an A, everything after this point becomes a, a missense mutation. So this generally frame shifts are really bad because it makes everything after the mutation out of frame. Um, and here is a three base pair deletion. And as I mentioned before, um, generally if you have a missing or insertion or deletion of three um, nucleotides, those are less deleterious as it's it only causes like one amino acid to disappear um, instead of losing everything after that point and like the frame shift earlier. So here is kind of a summary um, and what this shows is a base pair substitution uh, is just replacing one nucleotide and its partner with another pair of nucleotides. Um, Whereas a, and a silent mutation is where you don't see an effect on the amino acid uh, produced by the codon. Uh, missense mutations is uh, where it still codes for an amino acid, but not necessarily the right amino acid. And a nonsense uh, mutation is that premature stop that we're talking about. Um, generally, insertions or deletions. Um, have a pretty disastrous effect on the amino or on the protein uh, as it can cause a frame shift. All right, so the last uh, topic that we'll cover um, are transposable elements and their related sequences. So the first evidence for these wandering DNA segments or jumping genes uh, came from Barbara McClintock's uh, breeding experiments with Indian corn. And as you guys remember from genetics class, uh, McClintock uh, identified changes in the color of corn kernels that made sense only by postulating that some of these genetic elements move from one genome location into like uh, the genes for kernel color. These transposable elements move from one site to another site in the cell's DNA, and they are present in both prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes. And here's Barbara McClintock, and she actually won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1983. There's generally two types of transposons. Uh, you have the like the normal transposons, which move within a genome by like uh, through a DNA intermediate and your retrotransposons, which move by means of an RNA intermediate. And this will make sense in the following slides. Um, here's the example of a tr transposon. So the transposon will actually copy itself into um, a mobile transposon, which is, a, which is DNA. And this DNA will actually insert itself into another site. And you'll, here, you'll have a new copy of the transposon. And remember, this is through a, like a copy and paste mechanism. So that's important. So retrotransposons will actually make an RNA intermediate, which actually codes for a reverse transcriptase. And this reverse transcriptase will actually make uh, DNA from this RNA. And again, this double-stranded DNA will eventually insert itself into a new uh, site. And um, the advantage of this retrotransposon is because it can make an RNA intermediate, it can make many copies, and uh, this is much more efficient, and it can make many more copies of itself. The important takeaway from this slide is that in primates, a large portion of these transposable elements are, uh, consists of these ALU elements. And what these ALU elements are, these are retrotransposons that, um, although we don't know their function, um, we know that they're generally short and they actually can make up many of the transposable elements in um, primates. All right, so the human genome also contains many sequences of a tr retrotransposon called lines. And these lines are generally uh, really long and um, they have a low rate of transposition and they may even help regulate gene expression in humans. 
And finally, we know that trans, uh, transposons also exist in Drosophila. And here's a table of different transposons uh, in Drosophila. And like, for example, the 412 transposon and the copia transposons, when they jump into your gene, can actually cause your phenotype. Um, and here are uh, some reading material over transposons. All right, so the last thing we'll do today is a protein blast. Um, so the first thing you want to do is go to Flybase, and you want to jump to your gene. So the gene that I'll be doing uh, today is armadillo. And go to your the page with your gene, so arm for armadillo. So the next thing you want to do is go to gene model and products on the right side and give it a second to load so this might be a little slow. And now we're under the section for gene model and products. And the next thing we want to do is go to the section for polypeptide data. And when we get to this tab, we want to go to GenBank and pick one of the isoforms. Doesn't matter which one. And you'll be linked to the NCBI uh, page for armadillo. And here's isoform A in Drosophila. And the next thing you want to do is do a run blast. And then you want to go down and you want to blast your um, armadillo gene uh, into Homo sapiens. So the organism do Homo uh, sapiens. Give it a sec to uh, do the blast. All right, so here are the results for our blast of the Drosophila armadillo uh, protein. And here are the different results. So as you remember from earlier, the lower the E-value, the better. So here our E-values are all zero, or they were pretty much round uh, down to zero pretty much. Um, um, and the next thing you want to look at is your query cover. And... Um, and your percent identity. So here, uh, it's showing that your percent identity, which is uh, what matches up to, for example, here the beta one, uh, beta beta catenin isoform two of Homo sapiens, is a 67 percent. So we'll use this as an example. So we'll go to uh, beta catenin one isoform two, um, and this is what the results will look like. Uh, so the top is your query, and the query is what you have inputted. So that is your Drosophila armadillo protein. And the subject at the bottom is uh, what you're blasting against, or what you're aligning against. So that would be your Catena uh, beta 1, isoform 2, and Homo sapiens. Um, and what's in the middle is actually the results uh, of the um, alignment. So as you can see here, uh, these are what we call gaps when there's nothing there. Um, and 8% of this are gaps, and that just means there are no matches at all. Um, they're completely different. Um, the pluses are what we call positives. Um, as you can see here, and posit what positives are is that the um, your protein on the top and the protein on the bottom are similar. So if you remember that figure from earlier um, with the hydrophobic and the small uh, lipophilic, uh, those amino acids, um, the positives are the amino acids that are similar but not the same. And then when you have an amino acid in the middle, uh, for example, the W and the QQ or the SYL, that means you have an exact match. Um, so for your final paper, you need to make sure you um, 
copy or have this as a figure in your paper. Some more things to go over. Um, these dashes here mean that it's not in your query, but it is in your subject. And this means that your um, it's it's not seen in the armadillo protein, but these three uh, amino acids are actually found in your uh, human uh, catenum beta one uh, isoform. And let's see if we can find the opposite. So um, the opposite of that would be something like this, where um, you have a segment in your armadillo protein but it's not found in your uh, your human uh, beta-catenin.